you know, quite literally the road to the White House, the road to the Senate majority, and the road to our own majority in the House of Representatives, uh, I think, runs right through Michigan. Before we continue, please help the algorithm boost our reporting that ask the questions others won't by liking this video, clicking subscribe, and turning on all notifications. Thanks for supporting The Daily Signal. Now back to the video. The counties that you represent in Michigan have recently had a lot of visits from the presidential candidates and the VP nominees. Why are those counties important in determining how Michigan um, votes in the election and then who ultimately wins overall? Well, we're the vote producers. Uh, you know, that uh, that's the interesting thing is you know, have to go where the votes are, right? And uh, there's saturation in many ways uh, in Southeast Michigan. Um, that, uh, that is, I think, indicative though of the importance of Michigan as a whole uh, is you have candidates going to places like Kalamazoo, coming to places like Holland. Uh, we're gonna be having J.D. Vance in Kalamazoo uh, tomorrow on Friday, for example. Um, and we're, we're hoping, we're hoping that, uh, President Trump is going to finish his campaign in Grand Rapids for the third time. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how Michigan has just grown in importance and, uh, and as a crossroads, you know, quite literally the road to the White House, the road to the Senate majority and the road to our own majority in the House of Representatives, uh, I think runs right through Michigan. And some people have said that there has, over the last few years, been a party realignment in Michigan. Have you seen that? Absolutely. Um, and this, this actually harkens back to my own family. Uh, my, uh, my mother was a good Irish Catholic girl from Flint, Michigan. And uh, I've got cousins who are UAW retirees and communication workers of America and that kind of thing. And uh, certainly their attitudes uh, have shifted. And uh, this this notion of ever voting for a Republican, much less calling yourself a Republican, never would have you know, crossed their minds 20 years ago. And uh, that has certainly grown. And uh, it is uh, it's it's something to, to watch. Uh, then you look at what's been happening within uh, African-American and Hispanic communities. Uh, they certainly have been looking around saying, you know what, maybe our Maybe our, our, our morals and our sort of center of gravity of our beliefs doesn't quite fit with the, uh, with the Democrat Party the way we've been told that it does. And uh, you know, the same thing, frankly, is happening within the, uh, the Arab American community. Um, you know, seeing, uh, uh, seeing very prominent Democrat uh, Muslim elected officials in Hamtramck and Dearborn and other places around there uh, either staying neutral or in some cases even coming out and endorsing uh, Donald Trump. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty powerful and, and quite a powerful indictment of what's been happening on the Democrat side is they've, they've just not just drifted leftwards, they've taken a hard turn leftwards in many of their, uh, in many of their uh, stances and platforms and that kind of thing. And um, you, uh, you're, you're now seeing, I think, this whole notion that the Democrats were for the working man. Um, well, really, go Mark, ask Mark Cuban about that, right? I mean, go ask the, the billionaires that are part of the Democrat Party, and it's really become a party of the elites in many ways. What have you been hearing from your constituents in Michigan about what issues are most important to them in this election? Yeah, the, the main thing that uh, we continually hear about is uh, the economy, inflation, and basically quality of life. Um, it is, uh, it's just been crushing. Michigan's been over 20% in, uh, in, in inflationary increases and in everything from eggs and groceries to gasoline, uh, to home prices, insurance, car insurance has skyrocketed uh, here in Michigan. Uh, and, and some of those are state decisions and some of those are federal decisions. But at, at the same time, it doesn't matter to those per, that person who's pulling up uh, to the gas station or the mom who's filling her grocery cart and saying, you know, I, I don't have this in the budget. And, you, know, you, you think about this, you know, gas was below two dollars uh, with uh, with Donald Trump. And we're here. We are celebrating that it drifted below three dollars in some case. I just went past uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, gas station on 
corner near my house and it was back up to 325, but let's call it $2 versus $3. Well, you know, guess what? Instead of spending uh, 50 bucks a week in fuel and for gas, uh, you're now spending $75 a week and not getting another drop of, uh, of gasoline in the tank. Well, that's instead of $200 a month, that's now $300 a month. And oh, it, where does that money come from, right? Uh, certainly wages haven't kept pace with that. So that means you've got to make decisions about either your recreational dollar, like maybe you're not going out to the movies, maybe you're not going out to eat. Uh, maybe you're cutting back on the on the type of meat that you're buying at the grocery store. You know, those kinds of things are real world implications to the decisions that the Democrats have been making. So, um, you know, that's that's the importance, I think, of uh, of the economy on everyday Americans as they sit around the kitchen table trying to figure out how to balance their checkbook. A new poll came out today from Steve Mitchell of Mitchell Research and Communications showing that Trump is one point ahead of Harris and Mike Rogers is ahead of Alyssa Slotkin, which I think is a difference from his last poll. Does that surprise you? And do you think Republicans are going to ultimately um, have a lot of wins in Michigan this year? Yeah, it, it certainly has felt uh, like uh, momentum has been moving in the Republicans' direction, both for the president uh, for Mike Rogers, I think for our uh, uh, our uh, uh, U.S. House candidates as well, uh, as you look at whether it's my own race or whether Tom Barrett, who is uh, running to replace Alyssa Slotkin, who's running for Senate against Mike Rogers, uh, that should be a pickup. You know, the uh, the Flint uh, Flint seat that has been in in the hands of a Kildee, uh, the Kildee family has been uh, in, elected there for decades. Um, we've got a real shot there with Paul Young in the Grand Rapids area. We've got a strong candidate with Paul Hudson. Um, you know, so I think there's some real statements being made uh, here in, in Michigan. And same, it's trickling down to uh, also the state house races. Um, the, uh, the, the person who's the Republican leader now who uh, is anticipated to become the next speaker uh, is a constituent of mine. And so we stay in close contact. And so we've got uh, people like a guy named Steve Frisbee out of uh, out of Battle Creek, uh, Kevin Whiteford over on the uh, east side. I'm sorry, the west side of uh, of my district, uh, who have a real chance down. We call it down river south of Grand of uh, Detroit. Uh, there's some uh, great down river candidates. There's some Macomb County candidates. Uh, there's a candidate in Lansing the, that uh, Tom Barrett used to represent that area. That state house uh, seat could flip. So there's there's some real changes, not just for the federal level, but state level and even the county level. I've heard that Battle <clears throat> Creek, which I believe is part of your district, yep. has uh, some demographics that are typically Democrat that have kind of been moving more Republican over the past few years under the Biden-Harris administration. Is that something that you've seen happen? Uh, Elizabeth, absolutely. Um, it, Battle Creek uh, is home to both Kellogg and Post Cereal. Uh, there's uh, there's manufacturing. It's a pretty heavy union town. Uh, interestingly enough, when I first got elected, the woman who is the chair of the Republican Party, her husband was the union uh, representative for the line workers, the the electrical line workers, and uh, the the Republican Party in Calhoun County, which is where Battle Creek uh, resides. Uh, actually walked the picket line with Kellogg uh, uh, employees that were striking against Kellogg. Um, so, you know, that's, again, kind of going back to your earlier question about has there been a demographic switch and flip uh, here? And, you know, Battle Creek is absolutely part of, uh, of that uh, canary in the coal mine situation for, uh, for the Democrats, that they're, they've been losing their grip in some areas that traditionally had been pretty solid in their camp. And uh, in fact, I've, I've got a guy who's uh, working on my campaign who grew up in the area in a, a little uh, little part of the county called uh, Springfield, uh, which is right, uh, right inside of uh, Battle Creek. And uh, a couple of Saturdays ago, uh, Ken and I and a number of others went door to door in his old neighborhood. And he was just floored about what has happened. And it was just Trump sign after Trump sign after Trump sign. And, uh, you know, I remember one lady who, who kind of stands out in my mind. She was a retired uh, teamster and retired uh, postal worker. 
And, uh, and she was out there and you know, she had Trump sign out there. I asked her if I could put a sign out there. And she was like, absolutely. You support the president. Then I'm, you can have a sign in my yard. I mean, these, these, these are not wealthy suburbs by any stretch of the imagination. These are hardworking, salt of the earth taxpayers who are just sick of it. You know, they're, they're, they're sick and tired of having their tax dollars abused. They're sick and tired of having inflation just run rampant. And, and, and they feel like, you know, government's controlling them rather than them controlling government. And uh, that's, that's, that's a recipe for disaster uh, in a neighborhood like that. Democrats in Michigan have been putting a lot of emphasis on abortion in this election. How do you think that message is being heard by the large evangelical population in West Michigan? Well, not not just the evangelical population. I think everybody is seeing this as, uh, frankly, an act of desperation because they have nothing else to talk about. They can't talk about energy policy. They can't talk about economic policy. They can't talk about foreign policy. Um, so they're really kind of stuck on this. And, and here's the thing in Michigan. We had a very contentious, tough fought battle over this issue Two years ago, it was called Proposal 3, and it put an unfettered access uh, to abortion into the state constitution. And regardless of, of how you people voted on that, that is the law. That's in fact, that's in the constitution now of the state of Michigan. So this, this question in many ways has been settled here in Michigan, yet my own opponent is trying to uh, somehow spin this as I'm anti-IVF, for example, which is completely 100% true. And she clearly doesn't have any idea what my own family's story is about uh, having children and friends that we have had uh, that have been affected, uh, not just adoption and, and uh, IVF. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is this is something so many people have dealt with, but it's the only thing that they've got to hang and cling on to. So, um, you know, you're seeing them run that playbook. And here's what I'm finding from people. Uh, it's falling further and further and further down the list of priorities for them, not because they may not be passionate about it, but because they, they understand that we've kind of dealt with this one already. And, um, you know, that uh, that I think is uh, is uh, something that's going to end up uh, maybe ringing hollow as they've gone to this this well one too many times, uh, desperate for votes and for motivation. And people are starting to look beyond that and saying, yeah, but what about that economy thing again? You know, let's talk about that. And whether it's African-American males or Hispanic families or whether it's union workers, uh, that's what they're concerned about. And do you expect election results to take some time to be released from Michigan or do you think it will be pretty prompt? I'm afraid it's going to probably take longer than I would like it to, or frankly, anyone would like it to. Um, we just don't know how quickly. What I really hope doesn't happen again is the city of Detroit just shuts down counting. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that breeds cynicism and suspicion and all those types of things. Um, uh, one thing that has been a bit of a curveball uh, for us here in Michigan is uh, Prop 2, which was voted on two years ago, brought about early voting. Uh, no reason absentee voting, a number of other things that are getting teed up. And we're having a, a, a significant uh, a turnout right now, both in terms of absentee ballots that have not only gone out, but have been returned, as well as uh, early voting happening. And each county is required to have a certain number of sites open uh, nine days beforehand. Uh, so I talked to someone uh, uh, yesterday morning who she was in line at seven o'clock. Uh, she's a school teacher, um, and uh, she was in line, went in and voted early uh, on yesterday morning, and uh, and now it's kind of done and over with. And uh, what's what's also kind of interesting is as people are starting to do that and figure out how to use that system, they're able to kind of tune out a lot of those political ads that are just assaulting all of us on TV, radio, on our cell phones, that kind of thing. So, but back to your your, your question. We're just not sure exactly what the turnout is going to be because election day isn't just election day anymore. It's you know nine days beforehand, and uh, Michigan law, as I understand it, yet uh, does not allow early counting of those ballots 
uh, it, uh, it, it, you know, it's kind of, kind of pile up. So, uh, we'll see, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, every clerk that I've talked to, and I've talked to a couple of them in, in the last week, um, they understand the job at hand and, and they are taking this very, very seriously and are going to try to expedite this as fast as, and as accurately as possible. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we just don't need something like what happened in Detroit, uh, four years ago again. In Kent County in the Grand Rapids area has seen a kind of party shift from being Republican stronghold to being more blue over the past couple of decades. And I've heard that it's going to be a pretty close race in that area. Do you think that do you think Trump or Harris is going to ultimately come out on top in that area? And do you think it's going to be a close race? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be very, very close. Um, you're right. It has trended that way. Uh, it, Kent County used to be a solid, uh, reliable Republican vote uh, area, and uh, that has shifted. Uh, East Grand Rapids and some of the other suburbs of the city of Grand Rapids uh, have certainly drifted leftwards. Now, the interesting thing is the city of Grand Rapids, which is quite heavily uh, African-American and Hispanic, uh, contrasted with East Grand Rapids, which is your good old-fashioned white liberal, uh, you know, wealthy white liberal, uh, to, to characterize it that way. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's going to be interesting to see what happens within the city of, of, of Grand Rapids proper again, you know, with uh, sort of that shift of uh, Hispanics and African-Americans, especially African-American males. So um, we'll see. I, I do believe that the more rural and suburban areas uh, probably are going to be coming back a little more Republican. So is it possible for uh, Donald Trump to win Kent County? Yeah, um, uh, it, it is. Um, uh, there's a reason, you know, I mean, having him for potentially, hopefully for the third time, uh, wrapping up a campaign in Grand Rapids, I think that's a, that's a pretty big statement. And um, I think, you know, the surrounding areas, whether it's Muskegon County out on the lake, which I used to represent, Ottawa County, uh, which I currently do, Allegan County, uh, Kalamazoo will be a, a, a solid blue dot uh, in southwest Michigan, there's no doubt. But then, as we talked about, uh, a place like Battle Creek certainly seems to be shifting. So uh, it's, a, it's a big, giant uh, chessboard that everybody's trying to move those pieces around on. What will life be like in Michigan if Trump wins? And then on the other hand, what would it be like if Harris wins? I'll be nothing but sunshine and puppy dogs if Trump, uh, if President Trump wins, of course. Yeah. Uh, no, in all seriousness, um, yeah, I think what we have, many of us here in the state have been frustrated with is seeing manufacturing slip away from us. You know, Michigan has a proud, long tradition and history of building things, not just cars. You know, I represented the three largest office furniture makers. I represent two of them now, Hayworth and Herman Miller. Um, it, we, we, we build things here. We make things here in Michigan. Uh, not every state has that history and that tradition. Um, it's slipped away. Part of that is, is because, you know, we are a peninsula state, uh, which it's, it, energy is, is a real issue for us, getting energy in and out. Um, yeah, that so energy, you know, federal energy policy has a significant impact on the state of uh, Michigan, for example. Uh, our overall uh, tax environment and regulatory environment, by the way, when we talk about how to turn this economy around, it's not just about tax rates, it's about the regulations, this avalanche of reg regulations that have been coming down on manufacturers and others, um, especially small businesses that just simply don't have the uh, capacity to deal with many of these things. Um, that, that's the kind of rebound in, that we could have because at its core, uh, Michigan not only builds things, but it's an entrepreneurial spirit. You know, we're, we're the home of Henry Ford. Uh, we're the home of uh, so many, uh, Thomas uh, Edison, so many others that have been part of, uh, part of the growth of uh, the automobile, automobile industry and other manufacturing that has happened here. I mean, we, we truly are, an, uh, a, a, I think, a, a state that's full of an entrepreneurial spirit. And that's kind of been getting squashed under the thumb of government in many ways. And so I, I think it'll be very positive. You know, as far as the, the Harris administration, uh, I don't think there's going to be any kind of change from what we have been seeing under the Biden-Harris administration, unless it's worse. 
it, you know, I think uh, this this whole this whole line of uh, a story that she's trying to sell here of her being a change agent. You know, day one, I'm going to come in and I'm going to change. Uh, you know how middle income America has been impacted by oh me as vice president. You know it just rings hollow uh, for so many of those people, and uh, you know I, I I don't see that there's going to be any significant change in energy policy. I don't see that there's going to be any kind of. In fact, she has said she's going to be raising taxes uh, on uh, not just uh, not just big co- corporations. That's an easy one to beat up on, but it's those entrepreneurs that I was just talking about who uh, usually are a first or maybe a second generation family owned company that's, you know, an LLC or that's uh, as a sole proprietorship. Uh, those folks could get absolutely hammered. And, you know, this whole notion of having a tax on unrealized gains. Well, what is that? I mean, there's no even definition, not just legal definition, accounting definition of what that would be. And um, so uh, that that's the kind of thing that I think would continue this slow uh, slow motion uh, failure of the United States, uh, much like what we've seen in Europe. And, you know, with the less than 2% economic growth of uh, Barack Obama, I believe it was 1.8 or 1.9%. And Donald Trump was up at more like 4%. Well, that's not a 2% increase. That's a doubling of the economic growth. You know, going from 2% to 4% increase uh, in growth is a doubling of that growth. And that's how we uh, really restore the, the American dream and, and that, uh, that confidence that people need to have in, in our economy and in our country. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs>